So, good evening, Benjamin. Yeah, good evening. How are you? I'm not bad. Is the house all quiet now? Has everybody gone back to the schools and the... No. Oh, they're still no. off? Oh, That's no. why I've still got this shocked, forlorn, gaunt face. <laughs> I just assumed you were missing some specific type of vitamin or something. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what happens. School holidays when you're you spend your days standing in the rain at Burntwood Alpaca Farm, watching a <laughs> five-year-old bounce on a trampoline. You know, I mean, they don't get me wrong. In these, the drizzle. These, these are beautiful times, but you know, there's a lot of staring into the middle distance, thinking, when are they fucking going back to school? <laughs> so. <laughs> Very, very relatable to most people in the country, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's a good and a bad thing. It's good. For, it's obviously good for them. I don't know. You remember the six weeks holidays? You, they seemed to last forever, didn't they? You yeah. know, when you were a kid, and they were, you know, they were great fun. But uh, you know, I'm going to sound like an old fucker now. But our generation went out and played more. There was more. You know, obviously, there's less internet, and you had yeah. to. I just remember playing football constantly. So it's trying to keep. I've been going back to work. So Rosa's gone to like a holiday club. But Alana's been sort oh, of like, a bit... Like camp, disaster. like they do in America? Uh, a little bit. There's like a local one run at a local school and you, you have to pay for it, but it helps. Like while me and Karen are working, we can go and drop her off and it's called Fun Fest and there's loads of there's lots of fun and itinerary going on and face paint and all that sort of stuff. So that, that's all good. That's in the Midlands, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just up the road. Of... We live in a place called Walsall Wood near Aldridge, but this is just up the road in Four Oaks, which is near Sutton Coalfield, which is very posh. All right. So she gets to mix with some Bartholomews and Oscars oh, and stuff like hell. that. And there's slightly yeah. slightly less broken glass than if it was really local. Less broken glass and a little bit more papaya, I believe. <laughs> And yurts. <laughs> Tends to be the trend. So th- the school holiday is coming to an end, so that's a good thing. How's your August been? What have you been up to? Uh, not a lot. End of July, went to um, Nell's. Went to all Nell's with oh, yeah. Karen for a birthday. That was good. Still really, really good Nell's. We've been going there for 20, 25 years. More than 25 years now. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that because what came up, a girl that I know organised like um, a school reunion a few weeks ago because we'd my year had, it had been thirty years since we left school. Yeah. So you have these landmarks, don't you? Like I couldn't go because I had a few family commitments going on. I, I really wish I could have gone. Uh, yeah. So it'd been thirty years since I left school, and she did it at a club in Tamworth. And um, you could have worn your yeah. Ainsley Harriet T-shirt. I could have. Yeah. There's a chance <laughs> missed there, wasn't there? Massively. <laughs> but um, yeah, you have got these landmarks, don't you? Like, because you leave school at sixteen, and now I'm forty-six, and you think thirty years since you left school. But yeah, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. well it's thirty years since um, Dookie by Green Day this year. Oh no way. Oh that's it where albums come up as yeah, well. Yeah, that's that's the real kick in the bollocks. It's when records come out and it's like, you know, fucking hell. 30 years. I remember being See? hitchhiking around somewhere and hearing Green Day on the radio and thinking, fucking hell. I hope this wan crew's driving shuts up at the end of this so I can hear who the fuck it is. Was it oh 1993 then? It was something like that. Yeah, must have been. Wow. I was very bohemian back right, then. Because I know 1993 was Snoop Doggy Dog's first album, Doggy Style. <laughs> so <laughs> that was an earmark thing, thinking that was 30 years old. I couldn't believe it. We used to take that on tape to a, every party that we went to. It'd be nice if you and Snoop but you'd mapped each significant event in your life through Snoop albums. <laughs> yeah, well, he's done enough. Oh, and um, we've been away the last couple of days. That's what I meant to tell oh, you. yeah, you said you went to... Was it, um, Bakewell or somewhere. Or... Went to Bakewell and had yeah. a. When you get there and then there's suddenly this localization of they don't like you calling it Bakewell tart. It's all about Is Bake- it Bakewell pudding. Bakewell pudding, Mike. And it comes in a bowl and it's hot and it's got a gooey, thick sort of texture to it, almost like you know, like egg custards, how they look. Yeah. But thicker and gloopier and browner and warm. And that's the Bakewell pudding pastry top. And then at the bottom is like a warm, watery jam. Very nice. Really nice. Mm. I know I'm not selling it to you. <laughs> I can see what you face. But that's that's just a completely different dessert, isn't it? Oh, com- oh yeah. That's not the people of Bakewell saying, you're calling this by the wrong name. No, you, no. That it's is, them that saying, is... stop talking about this one cake and talk about this <laughs> other completely different dessert instead. Yeah. it was For them, it was all about the pudding. The tart went out the window. It was all about the pudding, but I had to try one, and it was it was worth it. Definitely, uh, I bet they still take the fucking money though. They've got Bakewell tart money. Yeah. 
Mr. Kipling. <laughs> they have. They've sold out. <laughs> well, tart was still on the menu, even though they kept, everyone kept saying, you can't say tart around here. And then we went, to, what did we do? Oh, we went to visit Chatsworth House. That was really nice. Oh, yeah, you showed us a photograph of uh, Rosa looking excited. She's completely fed up in one of the windows, yeah. But it's one of these, it's a stately home, but it's not National Trust. It's a private-owned property by the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. Yeah. And the wealth, incomprehensible Wow, just an amazing scale. Great to visit, quite expensive. But so you, you walk in round and then you get into a room that's full of artifacts from Greece that whoever, you know, some point, some member of the family down the line. Someone's, just like li- the <laughs> Someone's liberated them. Yeah, it's just <laughs> fucked off to a different country and stolen. So I start thinking, where's all this come from, you know? And then look at the history books and the, the guy, William Cavendish, who first built the house, he was like a chancellor for Henry VIII. When Henry VIII decided... He wanted Church of England uh, because so he could divorce or behead certain wives. It was the Reformation, wasn't he? So he decided we're Church of England and he was going to take everything that belonged to the Catholic Church. And this is what this guy did was part of. And that's how he got his wealth. Because I started looking around thinking about something to do with the slave trade. But no, he was just it's just someone that stole some a huge amount of land and property off someone in this country instead. <laughs> But then you get this brochure, and it's the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire that have obviously inherited these huge amounts of wealth down the line. Whitest you people know, in the world. Yeah, just going on about how great they are and about all these modifications they've made to this fucking house. You just think this is just all stolen money from generations ago. But someone's got to have it, you know, I suppose. Yeah. So, yeah, that was interesting. Oh, I went bike riding as well, which we've not done for years. There's like what, old, while you're away? Well, yeah, there's an old railway track that links Bakewell and it goes off to Buxton that then shut down. So now you can go get the hire these bikes and go on a flat month. It's called the Monsell Trail. And it's just these flat paths that run through these old railway tunnels and you go up to an aqueduct and then sort of ride back. And yeah, I've no, not done bike riding since about 18. So got one of those ones where Rose has got like a little BMX on the back. Oh, and, yeah, uh, tethered on. Yeah, but you go through these tunnels, and some of the tunnels are like about a mile long, so it's a real surreal experience biking. They're lit, like. <laughs> I was just going to say a traumatic experience for a child. But, yeah, really, that was that was fun as well. So, yeah, it's, it was good Good game. Anyway, went away for a couple of days, but it was really good. Oh, cool. I bet you had a sore ass the next day, didn't you, if you're not used to Fucking bike riding? Yeah. yeah, I'm knackered as well, yeah. The first, well, yeah, first thing you do when you buy a bike, everyone that buys a bike is you, you get one the first time you go out on it. Um, the next day you just buy a different saddle, no matter what it comes yeah. with. You think, oh, it's got a wide saddle, not fucking wide enough. Yeah, you end up shifting and perching on yeah. two different Yeah, last bike I had, I had a saddle on it like a bin lid. It was massive. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a bit suspicious that Rose wasn't putting a, enough effort in. Ped, the arm <laughs> yeah, with. put her on the front, that's the trick. Because every time I looked round, she was suddenly pretending to pedal and sort of looking away, whistling. But I just got the feeling that she was just smoking fags and... Eating wagon wheels at the back there. Well, fantastic. Uh, what have I been up to? N- not much really. It's all the summer's dying off now, isn't it? It's what I did get out of the garden was um, I grew a load of uh, gherkins this year. Did you? Yeah, up, up a trellis in the garden, and I harvest. I love gher- yeah, I love gherkins as well. I think anything, anything pickled is good, and I uh, made a lot of uh, pickled gherkins. Karen's not keen on when I start pick start pickling things towards the end of summer because we she keeps finding jars around the house that she can't tell if it's something that's got old paintbrushes soaking in it or if it's something we're supposed to have on the side of our dinner. And occasionally, you know, there's always them cupboards or that area of the fridge, and you get sick and just fucking pull it all out once a year. Yeah. Um. And Karen will be there on her hands and knees dragging stuff out of the cupboard saying, can we get rid of this? And occasionally will be, what the fuck is that? And she'll pull this <laughs> huge, like, medicinal-looking jar that you used to see in a chemist's window in the old days with things humming around in it. And I'm like, no, no, no. Let me... <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> let, me, still... let, me, let me have a look. And I'm just thinking... That's still maturing. Yeah, you is. have to think, you know, are things in vinegar actually, are they good forever or do they eventually go off? They're not usually around long enough, are they, to, to find out? I did. I, I heard if someone went for a meal the other day and they had fried gir- fried pickles. Oh, I made them last year or the yeah, year before yeah. when I did them last time. Frickles, they call them. Nice. Yeah, they were, yeah, they were yeah. great. 
Yeah. So yeah, we've got we've got new jars of things lurking around that are they're a bit of a gamble this time because I didn't have enough pickling vinegar, so I had to go search in the house for Mess. you know like the bottles of vinegar that you don't keep with the food vinegar that you use for taking rust off screws and things. Yeah. So I've got vinegar. that. I've got I had to f- <laughs> found a little bottle of rice wine vinegar for Chinese stuff. Yeah. Bit of chip shop vinegar, brown vinegar, a little bit of white vinegar left. All of the vinegars combined, so when they're ready, it's going to be a taste explosion. You do sound like a connoisseur of vinegar there. I'm not sure if... The... Not an actual explosion, because you can't use um, balsamic vinegar for things like that, because it's very it's very volatile, balsamic vinegar. <laughs> is it? It is, yeah. They used to use it in... Um, like, uh, we had uh, an uncle in the 1980s who used to come round for Christmas who was in the Basque conflict. Oh, it's Basque separatists in... The yeah, yeah, in Spain, and um, they used to use balsamic vinegar for making makeshift Molotov cocktails. No way. Yeah, I, do, I know custard powder can be very volatile. Yeah, the, and coffee. Because the sulfur it's in the, the, it's the dust. Yeah, the, it's the dust that comes it's off. It's the it. dust can ignite, can't it? Yeah. Because in custard powder, you've got dried egg, and that's the sulfur, and there's something. Yeah, but because my dad used to be a copper in Birmingham, and he was always called to fires at the cust- the actual custard factory, because <laughs> <laughs> they're all spouting while they were working. Was there. this a storyline from Postman Pat or something? <laughs> Constantly being. Here comes Officer yeah. Higton. Yeah, another fire. <laughs> straight from straight from fire, out custard. Factory. Another fire at the custard factory. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you've got to be really careful with balsamic vinegar. <laughs> That's a <laughs> bit of public information warning. Yeah, well. A- Eduardo, he was called. He used to come around at Christmas, and even the smell had set him off and give him flashbacks. Wow. He used to open a, open a jar of Branston, he used to dive under the tree. <laughs> Good times, though. And he'd moved, to, he'd moved to England to escape it all, do you think? Yeah, only for a few years. He, he married me auntie, uh, Vera, um, and it took him a few years to work out what she was like, and then he fucked off again. <laughs> he, he'd prefer... I think he was... He was sad when he got back that the war wasn't still going on, I think, yeah. you know. He preferred to be repressed in a war-torn area of northern Spain than spend yeah. his time with Vera. Yeah, have we got any other general life stuff to catch up no, on? No, not really. I went to a Wolves match the other night, but and it was um, it was it's cheap. It was a different competition in the Premier League. It was League Cup, so it's cheap ticket night. And I've took my nephew before. Yeah. So it's a lot of people that wouldn't normally afford to go to games get to go to games, like myself, really, you know. <laughs> and uh, I took my nephew once on one of these nights, and he asked me why why everyone around us had bits missing, including <laughs> fingers. Shoes, <laughs> teeth. One one bloke had sort of only half an arm. Fantastic. Yeah. So I went to one of them the other night. So it's like being at a rough wedding, but that was nice. Yeah, but me and Karen have kind of fallen out with fitness last year, so we're both trying to get back to the gym at the minute, which is dead hard and horrible like no one likes doing. But it reminded me of a story when we were in sale. It's actually why we left. I couldn't live in sale anymore after this happened. It was too fucking embarrassing. I was at the gym. You know, they have big screens on, and yeah. I was stood there between exercises looking up at this big screen and i think it was an advert for mcvitie's chocolate digestives and it was a packet of biscuits in it and it had um, little fluffy kittens coming out of the packet as if to say you know have a have a biscuit it's like a big warm hug so i'm i'm stood in the middle of the gym looking up at this screen with a with a big probably a big goofy smile on my face and there's a woman exercising, and she looks at me and sees me smiling and looks up to the screen to see what I'm smiling at. And the advert's now changed, and it now says in, in massive letters, <laughs> vaginal dryness. And she looked around at me have, as if to say... At that point, you should have winked at her. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we moved shortly yeah, after that. Yeah, is that what did you from sale? Yeah. Amy Schumer. Life and Beth. Amy Schumer, which I've been watching on Disney. I don't know what you've been watching on. Yeah, it's on Disney, isn't it? Um, Amy Schumer, I'd heard of, but never watched anything with her in until Yeah, this. she was in a... Uh, I think she was in a film called Trainwreck, which I... Yeah, she's done a lot of that kind of catastrophe, disaster characters, hasn't she, in things, I Yeah, think. and she does stand-up as well, and I've caught some of it and I, I like it. But then I, I look at 
this life and Beth, and she's written it, hasn't she? And a lot of the yeah, a lot of the, she reckons it's about about fifty percent biographical. She reckons yeah, and there's a lot of moments in it where there's like an awkwardness where she's finding it difficult in a situation or misread what someone said. Yeah, I think she she probably. It's not done intentionally, do you know what I mean? You know, I think that's just the sort of person she is. Yeah. But isn't it, like, it's very diff. You said to me, the first two, you know, watch the first two, get past the first two, because it changes dramatically. So the first two, she's in this life, isn't she, with all these wanky people around her in the city. Yeah, she's a, she sells wine, doesn't she? Yeah, and she's got, like, a, a fiancé. <laughs> she's just surrounded I do, by, I, like... I do like the fiancé. Just... Once, after the first couple of episodes, once yes. he starts... Quite a bit mad. He, he gets really entertaining. Which is just around, like, they're not nasty people, but her whole life is she's surrounded by, like, just crap people. People who, at one second, she thinks that they're saying something really nice to her because her mum her mom dies and a guy comes up to her and says, oh, you know, I've been carrying this stone around uh, with me and it's to do with the Jewish religion because yeah. she's Jewish. And she, he puts it on her shoulder and she's like, that's really... And he said, this is what you do, don't you, in the Jewish religion? And she's like, that's really nice. And then the next second he says but I've come quite accustomed to it. So he just takes it back off her. <laughs> yeah. And he, so like, there's a lot of incidents like that where you think, oh, that's really nice. But then, you know, you, you're sort of working out that she's surrounded by just crap yeah. people. So she leaves her fiance, doesn't she? And she goes back to Long Island where she was brought up and starts reconnecting with like her old yeah, crowd. Yeah, she finds she? herself, uh, Michael Serra's in it, isn't he? He's, um, she, yeah. she goes out in her capacity as a, an agent for a wine company to try and flog some wine to this little, it's like a little um, communal farm, isn't it? Like a little organic farm. Yeah. Where they have a few animals, but it's mostly, um, you know, growing fruit and veg and stuff. But Michael Serra's there and she kind of starts connecting with him and the completely opposite kind of people out there, you don't see them as a fit at all. No, but he's... But she's so desperate to get away from one version of her life that she kind of thinks, well, perhaps this is so far from what I'm used to that this is what I need. And she starts kind of trying to gravitate towards yeah, him. Yeah, and he's... It. And they, they do kind of click, don't they? It's, it's weird, but... Yeah. Yeah, I thought that. They've got really good chemistry, haven't they? Yeah. So she goes through this transitional period, and like in the third episode, I've watched up to like four, and I watched five as well last night, and it's four or five that it really started to get funnier yeah. and better moments, and you sort of connected with her better, and she became better, she like funnier, and but that Michael Sarah character as well, she's like, he keeps all these rabbits, doesn't he? <laughs> and she's like, he's got a name, and he's like, I don't give the rabbits a name. And then you, she yeah. has lunch later, and... <laughs> She goes, well, what's that? And he goes, rabbit liver. And he goes, that's why I don't name the rabbits. And she's spinning it out. You could see that but coming a mile off, couldn't you? But it was, ni- it was yeah. nicely done. But I really liked it. Like, I've been warming up to it. And like the last one I watched last night, it made me laugh a lot. And I like her better in it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the first thing to try. Well, first thing for me anyway with Amy Schumer. And it might as well be something that's uh, her story. Yeah. And yeah. I bet it's very relatable to people as well because... You know, her life's not a complete disaster, is it, before? It's it's just n- not satisfying. Not, yeah. yeah. I suppose you, get, you know, she's... You get, and then the mum character is like, she's she's terrible, isn't she? Like, I know, like, I know we've already said that she she dies, but she's like, um, she's like really overpowering and eccentric, isn't she? And it's like a bit of a recurring theme in some comedies. Like, remember um, Colin from Accounts? Her mum in it was yeah, overpowering. Yeah like really sort of quite a lot of the things that she's saying to him were sort of bit of nasty undertones and things like yeah. that well even um they did it in motherland didn't they with uh lucy punch's <laughs> yeah. character yeah. joanna lumley yeah that's and they brought they brought the mother yeah. in joanna lumley in that and for the first time it, it made you actually feel quite bad for the daughter's character because you thought fucking hell you've had absolutely no chance yeah yeah with her as a mother it's like I say with Life and Beth, I like it, but it took a few it took a few to get going. But it's like that with anything really, isn't it? You know, it always takes a few to warm up. But specifically with that, because of the, the lifestyle change after two episodes. And it's a bit of a recurring theme, isn't it, when you watch um programmes where someone's life's a bit shit and they, they try and reevaluate by going back to you know, their younger days and their younger yeah. friends. Do you know what I mean? You haven't got to the, the uh, episode where she goes for an MRI yet, have you? Uh, no, I don't she think so. For, she no. goes for a scan on, on her back, I think. I think she hurts her back and goes for an MRI. Um, 
and there's a, a British comedian called Phil Wang who uh, turns up as the MRI yeah. operator. And it's just really right. funny. He's, he's got secret aspirations to be a DJ. So, of course, when you're going for the MRI thing, um, you have to wear headphones. <laughs> and whilst he's in there, he, he's he's trying to do a DJ set on it. Trying to convince people to love his music just one at a time. Yeah. Each time one person goes. <laughs> one <laughs> one trapped person at a time. Uh, yeah, so what have we watched that on? Disney Plus, um, Life and Beth. Very good, very funny. Over to you for the next one. Uh, oh, um, Barbie. Barbie. Yeah. yeah. So I took Rose along to see Barbie. And to be honest, really, I mean, she was five. She's going to be six soon. But even all the bright colours and, you know, all the good things for kids to look at, you know, she got quite bored halfway yeah. through. But I knew it was only an hour and a half. And like if I had to sum it up, it just wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know, in, in fact, there were some parts of it that were quite... <laughs> <laughs> were quite good but it's because we watch tv and film there was a lot of english a lot of british actors in i don't know if you yeah. know know this but there was step the guy from stethlet's flat oh yeah god he gets around he was in it so there's a scene with him in it part of the storyline you know she barbie starts thinking about her own demise and death and she gets cellulite and yeah it's a bit existential isn't it yeah and she so she has to sort of go back to the real world to sort of find out what woman has been playing with Barbie and having these sort of real life issues and so on. So Ken jumps in the back of the car played by Ryan Gosling and he's really good as well. And then she gets back to the real world and Will Ferrell is in charge of Mattel and he's got this string of businessmen at the side of him. One is Steph Let's Flats guy. There's an English guy that that's from something called SAS Rogue Heroes. He's there. Rob Brydon's Oh, yeah, I'd heard he was in it. I don't know if you ever caught people just do nothing, but there's a great character called Chibadi G, who's like a, a market seller. He's in it. There's a, a character called Alan, played by Michael Cera, that we've just been on about that was in Life and Beth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan was very popular on Twitter when Barbie came out. Yeah, yeah. So, and he was, that was quite good in it. And there's quite an extensive cast, and there's, there's some sort of genuine funny moments in it. Like, there's a bit where Ken gets back to the real world, Ryan Gosling, and you see this montage of what makes men men, and he, he sees it. Because in Barbie Land, the men are inferior, and he he sees this sort of men being men in LA. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's funny. And then there's other moments where Margot Robbie's sitting in a park, and she's learning human emotions, and she looks around this park, and she's seeing people laughing, crying, arguing. So there's some genuinely sort of decent moments. Oh, and there's some real surreal moments. Do you remember Carla from Cheers? Oh, Rhea Perlman, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the the moody barmaid. Well, she plays the woman that invented Barbie. So Margot Robbie as Barbie has these real Matrix-style moments with Carla from Cheers, like drinking tea with her and then walking through like these white rooms together talking about the whole um, reason yeah. of existence. So, like, And if you read any Barbie reviews... No one mentions it that, you know, there's these really good scenes with Carla from Jesus. It goes in these really weird places. Yeah, yeah. There's probably not ever been or going to be a film like it, really, in its weirdness. But, you know, it wasn't shit weirdness. It was something that held your attention. I found myself, like, watching an hour and a half of it, no yeah. problem, you know. And there's a definite feminism vibe going on there. But, yeah. you know, it was all really playful, really, and... There's one sort of monologue where a woman has a rant about what's expected of a woman, being a mother and having to go to work and stuff, and that is really good. It's only like one or two minutes, yeah. but it's very articulately done. You know, it doesn't take over the whole film or anything like you that. You can learn a lot more about this kind of film these days if you go on IMDb mm. by going down and looking at the one-star reviews. Oh, that's my favourite thing to do. It's, you know, the people that are desperately angry about the... the and it's always the people that have put two hours of my life wasted and, and you always think that's going to be a good one. People who immediately use the word agenda. <laughs> <laughs> it's the liberal agenda. It just makes me think, that'll probably be all right, that. I'll give it a look. I might, I might have otherwise <laughs> not watched it, but now I've read that. And you fucking gonks are all getting in a froth about it. I'm going to give it a go. The anger's going to be at the Ken character, Ryan Gosling, because when he gets into the real world, he realises that in the real world, men 
men sort of are in charge yeah. over here. But he just becomes obsessed with horses <laughs> for some <laughs> like, and that's right. That's really random. He he like buys a cowboy outfit and rides his horse everywhere. And when he gets back to Barbie world, he's obsessed with horses and stuff. It's uh, it's just funny, you know. It sounds it. Quiz time. Ooh. We've got something a little bit different this month as well. It's another sounds quiz. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it off screen. I'm going to have to move my microphone a bit. I've I've built this special electronic device. I got a kit off uh, AliExpress. Because uh, I was thinking about right. last time, the last uh, show that we did, we were talking about the concept and likelihood of haunted worktops made of, uh, yes. made, yeah, made the quartz, of, made of quartz yeah. and it got me yeah. thinking. Yeah. You know, it would be a way to test it. So I got myself a couple of dozen of these uh, lovely, beautiful quartz crystals. No way. Look at that. They look just like my worktop. Yeah, except less like sort of Egyptian sex toys than these do. That's right. Just like my worktop. <laughs> <laughs> I can't chop anything on it, but, you know. It's good for um, stopping melons from rolling around. <laughs> Yeah, holds pineapples well. <laughs> so um, I've suspended quartz crystals all around the home and surrounds, mm. and I left them there for a couple of weeks to absorb any kind of... Strong emotions. Strong and so emotions, on. atmospherical resonance, and, of course, the sounds of um, some household appliances that they might have been close by. Um, and I've created this box which filters those sounds and converts them to sounds that we can then enjoy. Let me <laughs> let me fire him up. So Mike's now holding what seems to be a miniature uh, bedside cabinet, possibly straight chest of drawers, with a, a large uh, furry rodent on the top. <laughs> now, now the magic's happening. Now, numerous red lights. Both sides. Uh. <laughs> there we, there we go. And uh, to illustrate how it works, you'll um, you'll see if I switch it onto detection mode. Yeah. All oh, right. Have you made that? You need to put... I know you're oh. an avid... It's off. it's off again. You need to put a picture of that on Twitter. People need... I might, have, people need, I might shoot a little video of it. Yeah, the world needs to see that. Do you think? 100%. 100%. So, I have um, re- made these various recordings around the place and I've converted them to normal sounds that me and you can hear and everyone can hear. And we're just going to go through them. There's eight. Right. So you've got them there and I've got them here. What I'll do is Mm -hmm. I'll play it once and then if you need to listen to it again, you can play at your end as many times as you want. Okay. That sound good? Yeah, it sounds like a plan. Oh, that's sound two. (laughs) No, has has it got a number? The file? (laughs) <laughs> of all the things that I saw going wrong you being able to count to eight wasn't one of them Is this what your quartz crystals have picked up? Yeah. That- They've picked up the sound of the appliance and any kind of disturbances in the airwaves. That was an appliance. It sounded like a kid's TV show. Yeah. Da, 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 Here
Anyway, move. Have, have you got a pen and paper with you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, any any thoughts about number one then? Just just jot them down. Uh. Okay. So these are appliances that you can find around the home. Appliances, household objects, nothing that you wouldn't find around the the house. Right. Okay. Right. Go on then. Uh, Go for number, number two. two. Right. What does that remind you of? <laughs> a religious. <laughs> do you want me to tell you now or tell you? Uh, well, just do you, do you want anything down. Do you need to hear it again? Or no, uh, no. I think I've got that one pretty much. Oh, ah, right. Okay. Uh, number three. Let's see what number three. Okay. Yeah. Don't don't need yeah. to do it again. No, no. Okay. So what do you make of this one? <laughs> Play that one again. Ah, finally, here we go. See, this is how you can pull people out, whether they're human or not, if we were invaded by aliens, because a human could not fail but laugh at that. It's just what the crystals pick up. Well, we're on to number six now, just to clarify. Uh, Number five. Oh, wasn't that just number five? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're still struggling with these numbers. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Number five. Right. Got that one. Got that one. Right, now number six. Yeah. Got that. Quite a lot of number six, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, number seven. Uh, this could be an interesting one. <laughs> All right. Which brings us on to the last one, which is number eight. Okay. And that's all eight. Perfect. So you've got a list. How do you think you've done before we go through them? Uh, terrible, because one, I'm struggling to count, and um, they're all very, very difficult. Well... It's very difficult to think of household appliances that have, you know, ghostly personalities. Yeah. Well, imagine the difficulty, of course, after I recorded all these, we had to load all this stuff up in the back of a van and take it down to see the local priest to have it all exercised. Of course, you know. of course, yeah. Um, okay, what have you got for number one? Now, number one, I, I couldn't be very descriptive about this. 
it was just I, I was a bit obsessed with the children noises, the children playing, and the sounded like some kids program off the telly, like um, CBBS yeah, or something, something like that. No, it wasn't a TV. It was uh, let's let's have a listen to how it should have sounded. There'll be people all over the country going. That's our washing machine. <laughs> It? It's an LG washing machine. It's the tune that it plays when it's finished its cycle. Really? Yeah. It's strange that though, isn't it? Because I don't know any other washing machines that do that. Um, number two. What have you got for number two? Religious Hoover. Religious Hoover. Yeah. Oh, it's close. Whoever listen how it should have sounded. Yeah. I can tell the listeners by Ben's face, he still doesn't know where it is. <laughs> is it the loading of an old VHS videotape <laughs> when you're trying to do it quietly in the middle of the night? Uh, no, it is. Printer. Printer. Hey, Yay. well done. So not a religious not Hoover. Not a religious Hoover. Damn it. Uh, number three. Three. What did you have for number three? Oh, it sounded like, you know, when you played music at school yeah. and you got like a, tri- a triangle to the triangle yeah it sounded like someone was blending <laughs> them yeah uh, <laughs> blending a triangle plus sheep plus sheep Microwave. No triangles. No to be triangles seen. to be seen or sheep. I don't know where that came from. Doesn't it make you wonder about the history of your home, though? We, uh, <laughs> you know, you think. Wonder if a family ever lived here. Was it part of a farm, perhaps? <laughs> you know, we always assume that this house was been built some point in the 1980s, but you just don't know. No, you know, this this is the secrets that the quartz brings to the forefront, it is. isn't it? Right. This was number four. What have you got for number four? Um. Industrial footsteps stroke ghostly whoopee cushion. <laughs> is my new ringtone. <laughs> is a new name for the band. You might know what this is. Let's have a listen. Dogs eating carrots? No, no. It's actually the sound of our cat having a shit. <laughs> oh, when they do that thing in the literature, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't sound... Yeah, that's that's Alice Alice in the litter box. <laughs> Not to be confused with Alice <laughs> through the looking glass. <laughs> Alice, Alice in the litter box, the difficult third novel. Uh, number five, what did you have for number five? Nazi washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is, uh, without a doubt. Well, let's see, what, let's see where it should have been. Here comes the evidence. Oh, the end of a record. The end of a record, vinyl skipping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Close, though. Yeah, that's the closest I've been. I don't have to worry about getting you a prize this month, <laughs> looking, at the, <laughs> looking on the bright side. Uh, where's number six? Number six, did you have anything down for that? Satan's Garden Swing. Ooh, I'd, I'd probably have given you a point for that. Blowing up a tyre. Yep, bicycle pump. Yeah. Tricky one, that. I think your answer was actually better than the reality of it. Uh, number seven. Oh, no. I thought this might have been the most obvious one. What have you got for number seven? Uh, crying while trying to start a lawnmower. <laughs> isn't it? It is, <laughs> Should we just it? say yeah and move on to number eight? We've all been We've there. We've all been there. What is it? Oh. Recycling. Re- Into the blue recycling. Bit. Of course hey. it is. I know that sound. Which brings us to the last one, number eight. What have you got for number eight? Oh, I can't read what I've put. Yeah. Uh, oh, sort of blending plane parts. <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. is that what it says, though? It could be the right answer. We'll never know. So, yeah. Let's have a listen. I think it is. Oh, it sounds like... 
That's a drink. Something to do with the drink, isn't yeah, it? It's a f- coffee machine. Coffee machine. There he is. There he is. There you go. I How do we a- begin to score that? It's easy. I have got them all right. We'll possibly give you three out of uh, three out of eight for entertainment value. Yeah, I, I don't. I think that's been very generous. I don't think I deserve any more of that. But obviously, you know, the initial recordings, you know, with its ghostly presence and the, you know, the quartz, you know, it's quite difficult. But yeah, yeah. well, I expect at some point after we broadcast this that one of the bigger universities will be in touch <laughs> after me possibly writing some sort of paper on it. I mean, the machine that you've acquired, I mean, is is it a name? Um, no, I mean, the, the the bit on top was my idea because I thought yeah. smarting it up for the kids, you know, get, in, get, them interest, <laughs> get them interested in sciences. Yeah, so there's the quiz. Brilliant, well done. We've been to 1980s Germany this month for our last thing, haven't we? Yes, Cleo. Cleo on Netflix. It's on Netflix, isn't it? It is, which came up in my radar because Stephen King on Twitter, who's usually got pretty good taste in things, was raving about it, so I said we should give it a go, didn't we? Yeah, situated in East Germany when the wall comes down in like the late 80s. And Cleo was working for the East German secret police, wasn't she? Yeah. Uh, Just before the wall came down. And she was sort of smuggling herself into West Berlin to take out, to do hits, wasn't she? Killing people. Yeah, she was an assassin, wasn't she? Assassin, (laughs) that's the word I was looking for. And then the wall comes down and the East German sort of government disintegrates somewhat, doesn't it? Yeah. And she... She's in prison by her own side, isn't she? And it's it's never really clear. It's not clear why she's in prison because she's been a successful assassin carrying out about twenty twenty. Yeah, she was. She wasn't officially on the books, was she? She was. Um, she was a sort of unofficial assassin. And as soon as all these institutions started breaking down, the they basically wanted rid of all their assets, didn't they? So they were just trying to make people go away. Yeah, so they imprisoned her. And by the time she was in prison, she lost a baby. And then when the wall came down and the East German government completely sort of dissolved, she was released as a, you know, sort of, she was a political prisoner. Yeah. But when she comes out, she wants to find all the people that were responsible for putting her in prison in the first place. And um, a lot of people have compared it to Killing Eve. Which it is in a yeah. way, isn't it? A little bit of Killing Eve, a little bit of Kill Bill as well. Yeah, because it's got that real life setting of a moment in history. So these institutions were real. Unlike Killing Eve, they have to set up yeah. these sort of, you know, these 12 and all these mystery sort of gangs and stuff like that. Because it's got those real institutions, real life setting, it seems a bit more believable. But it has got like this comic twist to it, a bit like Killing Eve, hasn't it? Like some of the way that she kills people, some of the, you know, the settings that she's in. You know, the, it is sort of a comedy, isn't it? It's it's not straightforward, is it? It's a, it's a bit um, it's kind of sideways. Yeah, it's definite sideways. Like there's some moments that are quite unnerving when she's found these people that she's tracking down um, that have put her in prison. And there's one guy where she's sitting in his flat and he's trying to work out who she is and she, you know, she suddenly sort of makes it clear she's there to yeah. kill him. And before she does, they both get involved in this sort of weird sumo dance, don't they, in, in his living room. Yeah. And then it puts to outside and he gets thrown out of a window. Yeah. So there's some bits that are so sort of quirky, they're, they're almost a bit odd. And then you've got a journalist that's trying to track her down as well, that's linking these murders and worked out. He was happened to be in a bar one night when she came in to kill someone and he becomes a little bit obsessed with her, doesn't he? I thought he was a journalist at first. He is actually a copper, but he's in fraud. Oh, is he, yeah, he's a copper who's in fraud, isn't he? Yeah, and he's, yeah, he's a bit of a clown. He gets on me wicked. Yeah, he's sort of following this storyline as she tracks these people down. So when she does find these people that's put in her prison, you're with her, aren't you? You're wanting to see their demise, do you know what I mean? They're not, she's oh, yeah, definitely. For no reason. I think that's the difference between in Killing Eve when Jodie Comer character tracks some people down you're like oh just leave him yeah or you know or just leave her because she seems all right you know what i mean yeah. but with cleo you with her every sort of step of the way sort of thing it's got some good characters she- as well and it? it's got uh, the matey boy who she's kind of half sharing a, a an apartment with now yeah the guy from the west that's come over and yeah so- the guy who's into techno <laughs> with the with his fringe he's great yeah who actually, yeah. he seems to believe that he's an alien. And he's here to bring techno to the world, isn't he? And once he's done, yeah. he's going to go. 
it is a bit Killing Eve. It's almost like Netflix have watched Killing Eve and thought, right, we're going to do our own sort of version of it, but it's going to have a totally different setting. And of course, it's all in German, isn't it? So it's subtitles. Have you noticed all, it's the, like a re- all the um shiny cars in it? Same as with the, the gold that we watched. I don't know if you've noticed, but oh, if you ever yeah, watch anything yeah. from the 80s, obviously they've got to get hold of all these um cars, you know, just domestic cars that you would have seen on the street. But the only ones that are around today are collectors cars everything everything you know that would look as it did look at the time has been scrapped decades ago yeah so all these programs that are set in the 80s if you look at the cars all the cars are really shiny <laughs> yeah 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 because they must have to borrow them off collectors for the program and i'm assuming collectors don't want them covering in shit for the <laughs> for the sake of authenticity yeah i've noticed that in the streets and stuff yeah but it's not too grisly either, is it? Like the murders in it. No. They're almost comedy rather than any sort of like really grisly murders in it. Yeah, that I don't know if you saw a film a German film from about twenty years ago called I think it was called Goodbye Lenin or Good Night Lenin. And it was um this guy living in East Germany whose mother was a, a you know, really enthusiastic party member, you know, comrades comrade this, comrade that. Um, she gets really ill and falls into a coma. And while she's in a coma, the Berlin Wall comes down. And when she wakes up, the doctors say, what you've got to do is not let her have any stress or she's going to drop dead. Um, so the family have to basically make it appear to the mother that the Berlin Wall hasn't come down. You know, this has happened while she was in a coma. Yeah. The stress of it will kill her. Um, they have to keep going through skips to get old jars to put food into. <laughs> Because yeah. the, the, the new jazz would give it away, and they have to get a mate of theirs. They set up a little studio and start recording their own news broadcasts <laughs> to show to her. And one day, because she's bed bound while she's recovering, they can't even open the curtains because the building across the road had a massive Coca Cola poster put on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these little little things that would give it away that they try to keep from her. But- and it, it, the feel of it's very much like this. Yeah, poem. yeah. She'd find out anyway, wouldn't she, eventually? And it would definitely kill her that all her family had been lying to her as well. Which brings us nicely on to our final section, which is food and drink. Well, more drink. <laughs> <laughs> food and drink. We'll call it wetting our whistles or something, but we'll we'll work on that. I think we should start with what I saw you tuck it into at the beginning there. What we did, we have decided that it, we're going to get round the discount stores like your B&M Bargains, Home Bargains, um, Aldi, Lidl. Uh, we're going to get the weird, the wonderful, and the anything that looks a bit shit, really, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're going to we're going to try them so you don't have to. The shitter, the better. But we, there are some good ones that have sneaked in as oh, well there are, under the radar. But we'll we'll get to them. Look, we'll probably start with the worst of the bunch, though. <laughs> what you had first, which was B and M bargains frozen pina colada. Frozen pina colada. Yeah. So it goes in the freezer, and then this is its downfall straight well, away. Well, I lost my yeah. It's... I lost my rag with this immediately because I'd had it in the freezer for a week got it out and thought how the fuck do you drink this and looked on the thing and it says now you've frozen it for a week take it out of the fridge and wait for half an hour by which part i'd had another six drinks of something else you know because i was that angry yeah so i had to pre-plan taking mine out of the freezer this evening and then you squeeze it into a glass and it's supposed to be like some icy sorbet but it instantly turns into some sort of yellow chemical Liquid. It looks like the yellow snow that you're not supposed just, to eat, doesn't it? Yeah, but taste of coconut. That's all. That's the only thing I really got from it. it. It'd be okay on a summer's day, but anyone that drinks this and goes, "Ooh, I'll get another one," you have to question their, their, you know. Uh, their... It was the only one that I didn't finish. Well, I've finished mine. It's been okay while I've been doing this. It's been quite refreshing, and you sort of just forget how bad it is, you know, if you're thirsty, don't you? It just, Do you know what it, I mean? it's just like licking someone's back in Benny <laughs> Just, there's, there's advertising just, campaign just right absolutely there. grim i don't really find it that offensive but there's no way i'd ever have another one because that's not the worst you see if you're happy to move on the one that i couldn't finish was the brothers cherry bakewell cider all oh, right well i was go on um my thoughts were it was so sweet 
like I've not really got a sweet tooth. So like if I have anything sweet these days, all I can taste is sugar. If I have a chocolate yeah. bar or something like I used to like when I was a kid, I'm just like oh, all I can taste is the sugar. So th- it's the sugar hit instantly. And then it's the chemical nature of the cherry bacon <laughs> flavour. <laughs> it was like if aliens, were, uh, we'd found that aliens had been trying to make cherries in a lab. You know, it's that sort of, and mixed in with the chemical marzipan nastiness. Yeah. For me, for me, and it's, you know, it's ironic because I've just come back from Bakewell and had a pudding, you know, that's the one I couldn't. I just couldn't finish. Well, I thought, like, I, know, I, w- I wouldn't have it again, but I thought it, it had more sharpness. I mean, artificial sharpness, but sharpness nonetheless. I thought it was just going to be cakey sweet, but it had a, a like a bit of a fruitiness to it that I wasn't bad. But overall, it did have a bit of a taste of like a sort of like a Yankee candle. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a chemicalness, isn't yeah. there? You can't quite. You see, brothers, brothers. I'm a, you know aware of the flavors that brothers do. One of them's toffee apple. Oh, that's the so worst could, one of the lot. Oh, yeah, like. After having this cherry bakewell one, I could not imagine what that's oh, like. Because you've got to get one of them if you see one anywhere. And they sell loads of them, don't they, in B&M? You walk down the aisle, and I don't know if yours is the same, but you've got lager one side, and behind you in the aisle, you've got like the cider and a uh, bit of wine and yeah. stuff. And you look at the brothers section, the ciders, and they've got fucking loads, haven't they? You know, they've got a. Oh, B&M's got a brother's wing. Yeah, but there's never any gaps in it. There's, not, there's never had any bottles taken off that shelf. It's just this wall. Of, it's electronic. It refills from the back. Wall of brother's nastiness. But I've not. I've only tried that one, so I, I, you know, I shouldn't be too harsh. So I will try the toffee apple. Well, it was only a little bottle, the cherry Bakewell one as well. So it was gone quickly. I got, yeah, you know, the like the normal five hundred mil size, like Magnus size. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I had one of them of the toffee apple ones, and Christ, I couldn't get through. What that. was that like as a oh, taste sensation? Just, if you thought that cherry Bakewell one tasted a chemical, I don't know. It was like an air freshener or something. Brilliant. Yeah. So uh, if any if anyone from Brothers is out there listening and wants to send us some <laughs> well, samples, well, remember Brothers because I'll be going back to Brothers with one of my wild card drinks later. Oh. But can I can I just ask you about sangria? Because I didn't get the sangria, but did you did, didn't you? What was that like? Yeah, I did a test of two sangrias. I got one from Aldi because it was in a milk carton and that appealed to me. And I got a massive <laughs> yeah, 1.5 litre glass bottle that weighed about seven kilos from Home Bargains, which was the better tasting of the two. Probably the most pointless thing I've ever drank. It would be a good mixer. <laughs> to, if you drink cider and black, it'd be good to use as the black. <laughs> you didn't drink... Did you drink all, all no, 1.5 no, litres? It's still in the fridge. It? I will, though. I'm not God. throwing it out. Sangria is just like someone's reduced red wine down and stuck a load of cloves and orange peel and stuff in, isn't it? I remember drinking... No, that's, that's bold wine. Oh, yeah. Sangria is... <laughs> I don't, I don't drank it in Spain. It's just at Christmas. <laughs> Ta- takes me back to Spanish telling Christmas. you what it's like. It's just got cloves and orange, and you have it with mince pies. No, that's that's not. Sangria is just you have it warm, cheap you? wine mixed with lemonade and a load of fruit in it. So if you imagine taking some wine that's fairly shit to start with and the amount of sweet stuff that they have to put in, because the finished strength's only about 4%. Yeah. So it's, it's, so it's only about one part wine to about... Two or three parts pop. Is that all it is? Four percent. It's honestly, it'd be. Oh yeah, that is pointless, isn't it? I thought it'd be a good drink for the office. I thought if you got a lot of meetings in a day, you could easily decant it into a Ribena or a Vimto bottle. There's, there's no smell of booze. There's no taste of booze. You know, sometimes you drink, you get a fruit cider or something. You go, oh, it tastes like pop. You mean it's you mean it's very fruity and sweet, but you can still identify it as booze. Well, this just yeah. is absolutely like mixed fruit berry cordial. Good for secret drinking. Good in a for work secret invo- drinking. Good for the office. I would not recommend sangria. I'll be finishing it, but I won't ever get it again. And did you try the Innocent Gun Stout, the oatmeal stout? The Innocent Guns, I think, are the are the clear winners. Both both the ones that uh, I picked one and you recommended the other one, didn't you? The Golden Ale. Oh, the Golden Ale's my new best friend. I love it. It's like 6.6% and it's matured in whiskey casts, isn't it? So it's got that taste. Have you tried that one then? Yeah, yeah, I've got one of each. Yeah, the, the Golden Ale's really a real nice drink, I think. I thought they were both great. The stout, I mean, I can drink Guinness all day, but it, this stout, 
It's not a session drink, is it? It's a it's a one or two. No, it I feels have... like you've feels like you've had a heavy lunch. I do really like Guinness, and I get used to the lovely creamy loveliness of Guinness. So any yeah. of these like um, oatmeal stouts or porter, I really sort of struggle with. They just taste like inky tar, you know, like black oil compared to Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Compared to Guinness, yeah. But uh, yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, it, it it was one of these things where it says on the bottle what the the flavour notes are, and you usually think, well, I can you know take that with a pinch of salt. But you know, they said it was caramelly, and it tasted caramelly to me. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was great. Yeah, I do like innocent gun. Like, I do like that golden one definitely. Yeah, the golden one was great as well. I mean, I, I was saying to you the other day, one of beer wise, I like, I tend to like them sort of tangy. Uh, IPAs that you get these days. But look at IPA and craft beer has gone mad, hasn't it? Like when we were growing up, it was real ale was camera, wasn't it? And it was men with beards in big burgundy jumpers. In Oh, camera beer dudes were brilliant. You'd just yeah. go in and it was just, they were like big clear bin bags full of <laughs> beer, weren't they? With plum a, sucker and stuff like that. Plum sucker and futtocks old scrot. <laughs> and there'd be, <laughs> there'd be a piece of paper sellotaped to the front with it just written on in pen. And by about half nine or something, all the sweat in the atmosphere had dissolved the adhesive on the tape. So all the pieces of paper had fallen on the floor anyway, and they'd given up any hope of putting them back on. And you just walked around pointing at things. <laughs> but now, but hipsters have taken it over now, hasn't it? It's craft ale and IPAs. It's all been sort of, you know, wrestled out of camera's hands. They must be actually loving it that it's been brought to the forefront so much. But it just all takes Well, you're, you're supposed to drink it in little glasses and sip it these days, aren't you? See, I'm, I'm not a massive fan. It just all tastes like homebrew to me. I've got a mate that puts his beers into two distinct categories. They're either driving beers, <laughs> which are like Foster's or Carlin, which he, he reckons that if the police pull him, you know, it should be legal to be able to drink them and drive at the same time. Oh, what's that fucking beer he used to drink? Not Banks's. Bass. Bass he used to drink bottles of bass. Oh, bass. And I'd say, oh, do you like that? He'd go, yeah, it's a good shower beer, you know. And then you get into this realm of like what beers are good in the shower. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Driving beers and shower beers. Is right. that is that everything? No. Is that? Oh, right. Go on. You've got a wild card, haven't you? I've got a wild card, and it's a blinder. So I was in Home Bargains, and I couldn't find they didn't have the sangria that you talked about. Oh yeah. So on offer for four bottles. For three pound ninety nine was Baby Sham. Oh. Baby Sham, right? Established nineteen fifty three, and its catchphrase was the happiest drink in the world. And I can't argue with. It. But it was invented by a guy called Francis Showering, who used to make it in Shepton Mallet in Somerset because it's essentially it was advertised as a champagne perry. Now, if you know what a perry is, it's just pear cider, yeah. which you put in these little miniature champagne bottles, hence Baby Sham. And it was the first alcoholic product to be advertised on British TV ever. And it was advertised advertised as champagne perry. And it was the first basically advertised directly at women. And that had never really happened before. Do you remember the advert in the 80s? where that woman sort of goes into a bar with her fella. And he goes, what do you want to drink? She goes, oh, I'll have a baby sham. And the whole pub goes quiet. And that cool bloke at the end of the bar goes, hey, hey I'll, I'll have a baby, baby sham. Yeah. That was great. Maybe one yeah. baby sham. But this, so this company set up in Shepton Mallet, baby sham, this drink, it's been caught in controversial and people trying to sue it and them trying to sue people throughout its whole history. The first person they tried to sue was a journalist who said, don't get caught out by Baby Sham, it's just pear cider. And they <laughs> Baby Sham sued it, saying it was deflammatory. And in the... Are we going to be able to broadcast this? In the summing up, the judge said that he ruled on the side of the journalist because he just said, he's made a fair comment, really. <laughs> it is fucking pear cider. But look at the bottle. But then the champagne producers in the champagne region of France got together and sued Baby Sham because they said it was... Um, a champagne perry but they lost it was unsuccessful <laughs> baby sham came out the winner Three. and then what else they got into trouble with um they also had a trademark dispute with you know that it's got like a happy smiling deer on bambi the... yeah yeah it's like a smiling bambi they got into a trademark dispute with kath kidson home furnishings <laughs> 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 they'd obviously stolen the logo off some fucking home furnishings company and she sued them 
but she was unsuccessful again and they can't. Hey. but um yeah like when i drank it it's obviously a pair side it's six percent and it's those tiny little bottles but it's a good quality one but so this guy this francis showerings his sons have taken it over and his sons through like a few sort of degrees of separation they're the brothers family that make oh, that brothers the, horrible cider. The horrible cider we was on about. It's now made under brothers down at Shepton Mallet, but it's still going strong. Right. Well, I think we've got about six hours recorded <laughs> there. So <laughs> yeah, that's two hours. It's because we've not. Uh, it's because it's been a, like a bit of a long month, hasn't it? So it's be, well. It's because we both forgot how to count during the quiz round as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that might be a heavily edited round, that. All right, mate. Sound. Good one. Uh, have That's a good one, and we'll speak next time. See you time. later.